Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness, mercy, grace, and compassion. Above all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for his precious blood, for your holy written word, and for the mighty Holy Spirit. It is with great joy, unspeakable, and full of glory that we deposit this service into your charge for safekeeping. Thank you for anointing every ear, mind, heart, and soul to receive the engrafted word. For for all that shall be said, wrought, revealed, and manifested, we covenant to give you and you alone all of the praise, the honor, and the glory with adoration and thanksgiving. We welcome and invite the supernatural of God to be in manifestation in this service, even as the Spirit wills. And Lord, we believe we receive these petitions which we have desired of you, for we ask them in that mighty, matchless, and majestic name that is above every name. And that is the name of Jesus, and everybody said amen. amen. Thank you, Lord, for healing this vessel of clay, too. Glory to God. Did I say here, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So we had been talking about prior to the uh, Thanksgiving break, if you would, the winning ways of godly wisdom. I want to take you back there for a moment because as we look at our pathway forward, the years to come, well, not even the years, the days, the weeks, and the months to come, do not, well, I think one of the greatest issues in this season in which we're living is the attempts of the enemy to distract us from focusing on the Word of God. There's so much going on. I'll be honest with you, the pandemic, I, I can't even speak of it in past tense. It is a huge distraction. Now, it is what it is. And when I say that, I mean it's a, it's a deadly thing, it's a hurtful thing, and so forth and so on. It, it is what it is by nature, okay? But I, I'm telling you, it is also a huge distraction. Now, that may sound as if it's being downplayed, and that's not at all my emphasis. I'm not downplaying the, the pandemic and the virus as a, you know, something we don't need to be dealing with, but it is a tremendous distraction because, because of its side effects and the things that it's done, it, you know, not just to people, uh, but to a lot of our institutions and systems and things like that, uh, sort of throwing a monkey wrench into the works, so to speak. Uh, a lot of things changed. A lot of adaptation had to occur. Many people had to make adjustments and so forth and so on. <clears throat> and in so doing, you had to shift your focus from one thing to another. And all I'm saying to you is, see, if you establish the principle and the habit in your life of keeping the Word of God first, getting up in the morning and starting it off with the Lord. I want to tell you, there's something to you speaking and confessing the word of the living God. Amen. You get up in the morning, you need to say it like David said, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, that's a, you know some people think that's just sort of a trite little phrase. No, 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 no. That's faith. That's faith. Well, it, it, listen, it doesn't take faith to know this is the day that the Lord has made. He's made all the days for that matter. But when, when David said, but I will rejoice and be glad in it, he's dealing with faith because he has no idea what's in that day, what's coming, what's not coming or anything like that. So when you get up and you say, look, I'm going to rejoice. In other words, you make a quality decision that this day you're going to rejoice in it no matter what. Now, what's the link there? Why is it that you can do that? Romans 8, 28 says, for we know. There's no guesswork here. In fact, holy place in James 1. Let's go back. I want to look at this. Romans chapter 8. Let's look at that for a second. And th this is a winning way of godly wisdom. It is wise for you to speak the word. And, and to confess the word, because to confess is, means to say the same thing as. That's why when they take you down to the precinct, the police grab you for doing, doing something you have no business doing. They're trying to evoke a confession out of you. Why? They want you to say the same thing they're saying. Well, wait a minute, what are they saying to me? Well, see, if they caught you burglarizing the car, they just want you to say, yep, I'm guilty. I was burglarizing that car when you caught me. So that's... That's what it means to confess, to say the same thing as. Well, 
uh, we want to say the same thing as God says. And here's, here's the, the word of God, Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that all things, what's left out of that? Wow. All things work together for good. Now, wait a minute. To them, there's a target that love God. To them, there's another specific target, who are the called according to his purpose. Amen. Now, that's not just pointing out the target group here is not preachers. The target group is all them, amen, that love God and are the called according to his purpose. And by the way, everybody that is born again of God's spirit is called to his purpose. Amen. amen. What is his purpose? He called us out of darkness, right? into the light, into the kingdom of his dear son, into his marvelous light. And that's his purpose. His purpose, of course, is also revealed in Jeremiah 29, 11. He said, I know the thoughts and plans I have for you to do you good and not evil and to give you a hope and an expected end or outcome. So every one of us has a purpose. It is as unique as we are. Now, there will always, you're always, you and I will always find commonalities between each other and other people. You know, we move as a group or we move as a congregate body. Uh, we're all doing the same thing. That's why Paul advised in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, he said, listen, y'all need to be of the same mind and you need to speak the same thing. There's something powerful about that. But I want you to look at it. All things work together for good. Now, all those things might not be your cup of tea. In fact, some of those things may be downright disappointing. But, Regardless, because of our position, everybody say position, right? Because of our position in the kingdom of God and because we're the target audience, if you would please, whatever's going on works together for good to us who love God and are the called according to his purpose. Yes, even, I know this is going to be deep, even the tragics, the tragedies, the difficulties, the disappointments, the hurts, and so forth. Now, it took a while to really come to grips with that. But hindsight, as the old saying goes, is 2020. When you look back, as the folks say, over my life or whatever, when you, when you look back at some things that happened, you couldn't see it while you were on top of it or it was on top of you. But as you move down the line in your life and look back, man, suddenly you begin to realize and discover, you know, if that hadn't happened like it happened, it's sort of like Jacob realized, he said, you know, the Lord was in this place and I didn't even know it. Well, you ought to know it because you're a believer. You ought to know it because, remember, you got a promise from God that says he'll never leave you or forsake you, even to the end of the world. Man, you Listen, those are essential and vital spiritual functions that all of us as God's people should retain and sustain on an ongoing, continuous basis. Never lose sight. Never forget that God is always with you, and he promised he would never leave you or forsake you even to the end of the world. Yeah, when you're going through challenging times, disappointing times, whatever, whatever you see going on, just know God's with you. And, and know this, know Romans 8, 28. Whatever's going down, God's going to bring you up. Amen. Amen. He, he's going to do that. That's, that's how he works. Praise God. Uh, I think about no temptation has taken you, but such as is common to man. But the Bible says God's faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted, tried, or saved beyond that which you are able that's you. That's who we are. We are those people spoken of by John when he said, now, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Yeah. Folks, that's as much a normality for us as believers as walking on our two feet, yeah. seeing with our two eyes, <laughs> eating, eating our meals every day. I, it's that much of a commonality. Mm -hmm. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Think that when facing difficult challenges. Think, mm, God's with me, for me, and in me. 
Think hmm, all things work together for good to them that love God and are to call it according to his purpose. Think that way. Think, think, oh, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Think, oh, I'm the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. I'm blessed when I come in and blessed when I go out. Don't let, COVID's not going to stop that. God said you're empowered to prosper when you go out. You're empowered to prosper when you come in. You are empowered to prosper whether you're in the city or whether you're in the field. See, blessed means empowered to prosper. I'm quoting from Deuteronomy. I realize that 28, but I'm just telling you, see, th that's the way you have to think. I'm empowered to prosper. My seed is empowered to prosper. The fruit of my womb is empowered to prosper. All that I put my hand to is empowered to prosper. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And these are times in which we're living, and this, again, is, is really the importance of godly wisdom in our lives. And I can't say this enough. I, I don't think I could overstate it. The importance of ensuring that your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, if you got them, are instructed in the ways of the Lord Amen. and in the Word of God. And that's going to be a difficult task if you yourself are plugged into it and it into you. Remember what Jesus said in John 15, 7, if you abide in me, not if you check in every now and then, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you, you say position, we said that once before, right? See, when he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, what did he say? You shall ask what you will. In other words, I, I'm just inserted. You're in a position. You're in a spiritual position and posture to ask what you will. A little blind there, but the Greek literally says, place a demand in the realm of the spirit. Now, most folks are going to think you're crazy. When you open up your mouth and say, you know what? I command that this happen, and I, I speak, and I declare, and I decree. Folks think you're crazy when you're talking like that. Why? Because they don't see an object. They don't understand that most of what we get done as believers and in the Spirit is invisible to their eyes. In fact, you want to know the truth about it, it's invisible to ours, except the eyes of faith. And those are the ones that God has given us to truly see with. See, except you be born of the water and of the Spirit. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? You can't even see. Actually, the word means perceive. You can't even see the kingdom. See, there's certain things I, I see with my naked eyes, but see, when the eyes of faith get focused on a situation, you see things other people don't see. You, you hear things other people don't hear. I'm reminded of David when he went out to confront Goliath. Remember, he showed up because he had brought all that food from their house. Remember, Jesse told him, I want you to take all this stuff to your brothers. They're up there on the front line. And they were out there with King Saul doing battle and whatnot. So take these cheeses, make sure you give some to the captain, you know, the platoon leader, the company commander. And, you know, I got all kind of goodies here. And I want you to take them up there. Well, see, David got up there. And something happened that maybe he didn't expect. Ladies and gentlemen, God always knows more about you than you know about yourself. Amen. Remember now, David's a little sh sheep herder. You know, he's a little shepherd boy, right? Remember I told you about shepherds and the way they were looked at back in those days? They were, they were like the low guys on the totem pole, so to speak. But they were more than that, and God knew they were more than that. In fact, David's whole story ought to encourage anybody that reads it. Because that's how God can take you from the guttermost to the uttermost. But anyway, David got up there on the front line and just so happened. You think this is coincidence? No, 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 no. There's no coincidence in the kingdom. Coincidence is something we use as a euphemism for, you know, the Lord's up to something here. <laughs> Ain't no coincidence that at the time David showed up with the supplies, the giant of Gath, Goliath, steps out and issues another threat. He's been doing this for some time, for days. And uh, King Saul's men are just, you know, they're cowering because they've never seen a dude this big. And he just comes out there and says, y'all, what are you doing? I'm, I'm, 
I'm going to take this place over. I'm going to take you, we're going to make you our slaves. And those men were shaking. Seasoned warriors were shaking. But David comes up, this little old ruddy little shepherd boy, and he hears the same thing everybody else hears with his natural ears. He sees the same thing that his brothers and all those soldiers of Israel in Saul's army see. But David, the difference between him and everybody else was the way he heard and the way he saw. He saw the same giant, nine, ten feet tall, whatever he was. He heard the same challenge. And when David heard it, he had something to say about it. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? See, because of David's perception in hearing and seeing, which was different from the way other people hear and see. He said, this guy has no defense. He doesn't have a contract with God. We do. See, David, listen, what I just got through sharing with you up front before I got into this, when I tell you always, every day, think this way. Remember those things that I was, I was sharing with you from the various passages of Scripture that I just dispensed to you. You know, always think in terms of, you know, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. That's who I am. I'm born of God. Therefore, it is a part of my nature to overcome the world. Wow. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a part of me. Well, see, David said this guy doesn't have a contract with God. But we do. Why? Because he, David knew that Israel was God's chosen folk. And listen, I'm not going to, you know, mix and mingle Israel and the church and all that. Let's know this. You and I have a new covenant based on better promises. Amen. All right. So all that they had, we got it and, and some more and, and even better. So we know that God, listen, back in those days, God could be for them and with them, but not necessarily in them. You and I, we have God for us, with us, and in us, in the person of the Holy Spirit. But David had that perception. He had that perception. I mean, why are you guys, what's going to be done about this fellow? Well, you know, you think this is a coincidence? About that same time, somebody hollers out of the ranks. Well, I got this deep into it. I might as well go deeper. First Samuel chapter 17, please, everybody. Let's go there. You all know me by now, man. I'm going to hoist the sail. Whichever way the wind's going to blow, by the Spirit of God, that's where we're going because God knows what you need way more than I do. Amen. 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 Well, now, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, speaking of Goliath, fled from him and were sore afraid. That's real deep fear. You know, they're trembling and nervous and sweating. Okay, that's what sore afraid means. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up? And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches. You know the difference between riches and great riches? We all get that, don't we? All right. And will give him his daughter. Wait a minute, I don't know if you... Listen, let's read into that. He will then become a part of the royal family. He's going to be related to the king, not just associated with him. He's marrying into the royal family. All right? And then he said, and make his father's house free in Israel. Let's read into that a minute. Go make his father's house free in Israel. So if, if one of us marries into the royal family, the rest of our household is tax-free. We're free. We're all part of the royal family in a sense of speaking. In other words, the benefit reaches back into our house. See, this is blind to many of us because, again, I remind you that the Bible is a book about a king and about a kingdom, and that's how kingdom functions. Look at the royal family over there in the UK, the queen, you know, and then you got the Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, and then 
you know, William behind him and all. You, you know, it's all these folks born in, and, and you know, they're quick to tell you. Their cousins, their, their daughters, their whoever, they tell you what their number is in line, in succession to the throne. Now, some of them are number 20. You know, they're probably never going to reach the throne, but it doesn't matter. They're, pardon me, as we say, they're in the number. Come on now. All right, we got Charles. He's number one. His son, William, he's number two. Then you got little Prince George. He's number three. His sister, Charlotte, is number four. What's the little boy? Louis. He's number five. And then see, you got to go beyond in some of the other ranks because you got, you know, they got uncles, you know, the, the other princes, sons and daughters. They're all in line. Little Eugenie and whatever the other people's name. They're all in the number. They're the royal family. It's amazing. They, none of, most of them don't sit on the throne. Most of them will never reach the throne. But their it's description is in Peter. They're a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, and a chosen generation. I want you to think about those three phrases that you know are in the Bible in the context of being a part of the royal family of God. I want you to stop and think about that for a minute. You, are, you and I are peculiar. We are royal and have a priesthood. And we are a chosen generation. What does the Bible say? You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Many are called, but few are chosen. But thank God we're among the few. I just pick up my spirit, some of y'all feeling way better than when you first got here. You need and I need to hear this. But more so, get ready for this now. We need to know this. Don't put yourself in a position where you're almost. <laughs> I mean, my friend says some people have an almost mindset. No, you need to have an utmost mindset, not an almost mindset. And sometimes when challenges come in our way, we go into an almost mindset mode. Wow, am I really the righteousness of God in Christ? Man, am I really on top with everything under my feet? Man, am I, I mean, really, do I really have what's it, what I need to overcome the world? That's, see, when you go to question yourself like that, I'm telling you right now, an almost mindset is trying to consume you. Take it to the uttermost and speak what the Word of God says. All right, back to our story here. David facing Goliath. So my point was, he didn't hear like everybody else heard. He didn't see like everybody else saw. He saw the same giant, whatever, 10 feet tall, not whatever he was. He saw the same guy, same stature, same weight. In other words, Goliath's physical appearance did not change to David's physical eyes any more than it changed before the rest of the soldiers. The, the, the threatenings and whatnot. Ah, All right. So now, so he said, it, uh, I'm back in verse 25. We see all the rewards that the king's going to give to whoever can take this fellow out. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? See, Look at the way David's talking about it. He's reframing. David is reframing. They're out there talking about there's this giant. He's tough. He's big. He's bad. David said, he's another Philistine. He reframed the situation. Amen. He brought the giant down to a level that he knew he was conquerable. Say amen, somebody. You know, you look at these stories, you think I'm just telling you a story from the Bible, and this thing is rich with what I call pertinent truth Amen. that you can use right now in your life. Amen. Hey, you, you know, COVID is like Goliath to a lot of people. Amen. But you know what COVID is to people of faith? Another pathogen, another pestilence, Amen. another something from which, now, now I'm just going to tell you, you have, to, you have to hold fast to this thing. The Bible says hold fast to that which is good. All right. It's another thing from which we've been redeemed Amen. by the blood of Jesus, Amen. from the curse of the law, poverty, sickness and disease, and spiritual death. 
whether you know it or not, whether you think it or not, whether you even believe it or not, that's, that's true. That's scriptural truth. All right? So notice, so David says, what, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? And look, and takes away the reproach from Israel. In other words, David said, this is a scandal. Why are we going through these changes here? This man is challenging the chosen, the royalty, the peculiarity of a people that's been set apart by Almighty God. In other words, David said, he can't stand. What he is doing out there in the field is temporary at best. That's David's thinking. What's your thinking about this, quote, giant challenges that present themselves to you? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? D David said, I, we, I know who we represent. You all have forgotten. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And what that phrase means there in that verse 27 is that what you heard them say that was going to be done to the person that takes his giant out, this is what's going to happen since you want to know. See, this is what's called establishing the matter. In other words, David's saying, what's up with this? What's going down if we take him out? What's going to happen to the guy that does it? You see, it's amazing. Now, you, you, you might think, well, this is some strange thinking. Why would David reframe this thing? And, and why is he speaking in terms, notice what David said, what's going to be done to the man? Because David, David walked up on a whole army, and they hadn't done anything. <laughs> wait, wait, come on, y'all catch it with me now, all right? They hadn't done anything. There's hundreds, maybe thousands of soldiers out there, and, and the whole group of them had to go. You know, you, you look at a fellow nine feet tall, you, it seemed like common sense would say, my God, man, there's 10 of us. Let's just take him blindsided from every angle and take him out. <laughs> Nobody even made a move. So David already knew, man, something's not right here. They're not even moving. So it, <laughs> what's going to be done for the fellow? Because see, David's thinking, I'm that fellow. Yeah. And Eliab. Watch out, your kinfolk. Well, anyway, Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. Now, Eliab ain't got no business getting angry with his little brother. He's not even addressing the problem confronting Israel. Now, he's going to get upset with David. David comes up and says, well, all, Eliab's problem is this. How come I didn't hear what he heard? Why didn't I see it the same way he sees it? Why didn't I inquire about this reward and all that's going to happen here? Come on, somebody. You know, I know, see, don't get out of this two-dimensional thing. You know, black ink on a white page. Listen, get out of that. These are real folks. This is a real situation. And God gives us the insight. See, the reason, you say, well, pastor, how can you, it sounds like you're assuming anything. I'm not assuming anything. Just, just look at this thing. Look, the good news is, as I tell you, as you study the Bible, you know, I haven't, I haven't said this in a while, but Maybe I did recently, but when I studied Shakespeare in, in uh, English literature class, I'm going to tell you, there was a bunch of people in my freshman class. We were all reading the same plays and stories and poems and stuff, and all of us made a beeline to the university bookstore to get the Cliff Notes and the Barnes Notes. I don't know what it is today. See, right now, Google is the equivalent. Of <laughs> anyway, we all ran there to that bookstore, man, to get and read to figure out what is this guy trying to say because we didn't know it. And all of us were trying to find out a unique way to write it in our own words and thoughts. Some of us were successful, others were not. It was the difference between your original thoughts and plagiarism. I'll leave it right there, all right? I'll leave right there. Now, my point, and even bringing that up to you, is this. The author of the scripture is still alive. Shakespeare has been gone for 450 years or whatever it was. Listen. The author of the, of the scripture is still alive. We're talking about the Holy Ghost. And listen, from everlasting to everlasting, the psalmist said of God, thou art God. I don't think you catch that. Let me, I'm going to break it down here. Listen, 
from everlasting to everlasting. So, you know, God was around when Bill Shakespeare was here. God was around when Augustus Caesar made his decree that all the world should be taxed. God was around when Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. By the way, you know what? God is around in a future you and I can't even see. It is the reason why the scripture says that God knows the end of a thing from its beginning. So when I'm sharing with you the insights that I share with you about Eliab, his attitude, and what David found when he got up there is because God can tell me what was happening then. God can reveal to me the disposition of the folk. They've long since been gone. They've been dead for thousands of years. But God was there. And God is here now. And God will be here tomorrow. Because he's the same yesterday and today and forever. And there isn't anything he doesn't know about yesterday and today and forever. Think about that for a moment. What is it that he doesn't know about any of our, what I call, human time zones? And I don't mean Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific. I mean past, present, and future. Eliab's anger was kindled. He got upset against David. He said, now why did you come here in the first place? And, uh, and, when, and you know, this is how, did I say something about kinfolk? But anyway, listen. And, and with whom did you leave those few sheep? You know, it's amazing. When people want to put you down, when folks want to denigrate you, they find any little thing that they think is a weakness, that they think is a strike, that they think is a mark against you, and they exploit it. Come on, somebody say amen. I can't get anybody to say amen in this house. They exploit it. Whether you're related or not, anybody that's trying to take, cut your legs out from under you or lower you or recategorize you. That's why folks never rule God out of the equation. Never rule God out of the equation. See, these boys here are about to learn something. Big brothers weighing in, man, what's this fool doing here? What, you ain't got no business here. Who do you leave them little sheep with? See, the, see these boys talking all this smack. If it wasn't for those sheep, they wouldn't be strong enough to be soldiers in Saul's army. Thank God that their daddy Jesse had a flock of sheep, a livestock like that. And they, they, they need to be thankful to God that God had David over them. Amen. No telling what they would have done with the sheep. Who do you leave those few sheep with? Well, see, see, you have to understand, David's got a reputation that precedes him. Yeah. See, remember now, the day is coming when the prophet's going to show up at Jesse's house, Samuel. Remember that? Uh -huh. and, and see, when he shows up there, because God sent him to anoint another king in place of Saul. Now, I'm moving into the future here a little bit. Y'all be with me here a minute. See, this hadn't happened yet, but, but there's coming a time when Samuel's going to make a visit to Jesse's house, okay? And he says, uh, bring your sons here. And then he goes through all these boys, the live all these fellows here talking to smack, and none of them is acknowledged by God to be the next king. It wasn't until they brought the shepherd boy, David, up from among the sheep. And what does the Bible say? He left the sheep with a keeper. See, for them to ask this question, who did you leave those few sheep with? They ought to know. See, David was responsible. Look, who's going to put you over sheep? And you're going to let lions and bears come. Remember now, you know, he's about to go in and testify to the king. Sire, I'll go out here and take this giant out. He's not in us. How are you going to do this, boy? You're just a little fella. These, this, this guy's been a war all his life. How are you going to do it? Well, you see, sire, it's like this. When, when, when you're a servant, very respectful to the king. I'm getting ahead of myself here. But uh, when I was a, a young fella watching over my father's sheep, they weren't even my sheep. They belonged to my daddy. A lion and a bear came in, grabbed the sheep. You know, I could have just said, well, you know, that's one sheep less. 
but I went and got them. That means David went after a wild animal with one of his sheep in its mouth. Folks, <laughs> do you know how mean an animal is when it's hungry and it's got food in its mouth and you're going to come up and take it? Really? All right. Wait a minute. Eli been through insulting David. Okay, first of all, he says, you don't have any business down here. Well, first of all, that's a lie because his daddy sent it. He was authorized by his father to go to the front line and take a bunch of food and gifts. All right? Who did you leave these few sheep? That's an insinuation that you're irresponsible, that you're negligent, that you're immature. Hello. I know your pride, he says. You don't know anything. If you knew anything, you wouldn't be throwing all this foolishness out of your mouth. I know your pride and your naughtiness of your heart. For you are come here. You, in other words, David, you, you want to entertain yourself. You, you want to see us throwing spears and chucking rocks and knocking out souls. You want to see a battle. You want to see some blood and guts. You come up here to entertain yourself. And David said, now what have I done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people, in other words, David said, well, I'm not getting anywhere standing here listening to you. Let me go where I can get some real information here. Y'all hang in here with me now, praise the Lord. Because I guarantee you, I'm standing up here, but I believe many of you have been through the same kind of scenario that David's going through here. I see why Jesus said the Old Testament was written for an example for us here. All right, so he goes, he turns from him toward another, spake after the same manner, and the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spoke, they rehearsed them before Saul. Now, this is really significant to me. <laughs> Apparently, David was talking differently from everybody else in the army. So much so that some soldier, he's not identified, we don't know who he is, somehow gets a message to the king. King, there's this young fella running through the ranks, and he's talking like nobody else talks. I gather, sire, that he's thinking like nobody else is thinking. Apparently, he's seeing like nobody else is seeing. He wants to know what's going to be done for the person that takes out this threat. And David, and, and, and listen, it doesn't take long. Once that word got to the king, the king said, let me see this fellow. Let me see him. That's it. Bring him to me. Because it's obvious they couldn't do anything with him. So bring him to me, Saul. Saul said. And David said to Saul, we, you see, we jumped from verse 31 to verse 32. We jumped from the word going to King Saul to King Saul's summoning of David and bringing him into the tent with him, right? So David says to Saul, let no man's heart fail. Now that's a real familiar verse. When I read those few words, I remember what Jesus said during his earthly ministry. He said, you know, there's a time coming when men's hearts will fail them for fear of looking of the things that are coming upon the earth. In other words, he says, there's going to be some more Goliaths. Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant, this is the respect, this boy has been raised. I'm sorry to say some of our young people, they just say anything to anybody anyway. I better say that again. Some of our young people just say anything to anybody anyway. They don't say, sir, ma'am, please. Thank you. They just blurt out whatever it is they want to say to whoever it is they saying it to any way they want to say it. Amen. I don't care who you are. It was because of my raising and because of my training that whether, you, you know, you, even, even little children, now some people might think this is over the top. 
But sometimes, and young people, I'll, I'll answer them the way I've always been raised and trained, sir and ma'am. I know I don't necessarily have to do that, but I tell you what, I'm in safe harbor. And I know if I'm addressing any adults, it's okay. Now, I, I may, perhaps socially speaking, outrank particular people. See, I learned that in what they called official social customs. There are people in different settings. It depends on the setting that you're in, who, who has the prominence versus other people. And see, as a, a member of the clergy, I'm talking about an official social customs. I'm not talking about in this crazy cultural shift we're experiencing right now. <laughs> but once upon a time, there was respect Amen. about certain people. The, it's, it's amazing. I saw a chart not long ago. I got my finger in place, so I'm going to get back there. We'll get, we'll get back. I remember seeing a chart some time ago about who people believe or who people, what you call, respect or honor. And, and for a long time, you know, a certain you know, heroes and clergymen were up there. And now that whole thing is reversed. Now it's a rapper and a... Do I really need to say anything else? And so the folk that were up there, in other words, it's a perversion of the first will be last and the last will be first. I mean, it's a perversion because the people that should be honored and respected and esteemed are now down on the bottom. And the folk that are out here training your young people to cuss, fuss, become totally materialistic, have an, have an attitude of ingratitude, and provoke them to anger and confusion, they're on the top now. I see why Jesus asked, when the Son of Man comes back, will he find faith in the earth? <laughs> okay. I said I left my finger here at the verse 32. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. Now see, Saul is guilty of judging the book by its cover. He sees this little young lad, teenage boy in front of him. And you know, Saul... Saul said, Boy, this, this, I like this. I used to be like this fellow. Full of energy, young, strong, ambitious. Just, you all sure got quiet there all of a sudden. <laughs> You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. And he, a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, he testified this way. Your servant kept his father's sheep. I had responsibility, regardless of what Eliab said. Those sheep grew fat and healthy and plenty of wool, regardless of what Eliab said. It was my daddy that sent me here in the first place. By the way, sire, here's your present for my father. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him. Oh, my goodness. He he, he's an initiative taker. He's proactive, not reactive. Say amen, somebody. Amen. And smote him. I caught up with him, and I, I threw some blows, sir. <laughs> you know, call me Rocky. Anyway, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I told you wild animals are real vicious, man. They're hungry, and you're going to come and take their meal out of their mouth? That's why David said, and he rose up. When he rose up against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. You're looking at this young fella. You say can't go out here and fight with this guy. And I'm taking out lions and bears in my spare time. While I'm watching over a whole flock. Your servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, this guy has no contract with God, no covenant with God. He's an enemy of Israel. He's come to defy the living armies of the, of the living God and of Israel. He shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. See what David's saying, and if he hadn't come starting something, I wouldn't need to finish it. 
You know, David wasn't just going out there picking a fight with anybody. Some people are crazy like that. They just want to pick a fight with anybody for anything. David said, I'm not picking on a, a fight for no reason. That's, remember that question he asked? Is there not a cause? Yeah, there's a cause. His name is Goliath. <laughs> there's a cause right there. He needs to be taken out. So David said, look, I'm not bothering. If he hadn't come bothering me and us, I wouldn't be bothering with him. And David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me. Th this is amazing. Remember what I was telling y'all way back in the beginning of this message now? Didn't I tell y'all, y'all got to be, th see, David is covenant minded. David is what we would call in New Testament times, God inside minded. This is why he's talking like he's talking. This is why he sees like he sees. This is what gives him the boldness of utterance. Standing before the king. King. Moreover, the Lord. You know him, king. He's the one found you. Hidden among the stuff. Remember? Remember? That same Samuel God said, gave the word to and said, look, go over here and you'll find him hiding among the stuff. Hmm. The saint, that's the, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. You know something? He sure sounds a lot like three other fellows we know. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Same scenario. A king says, who is that God that will deliver you from out of my hand? And they said, we're not even careful to answer you in this man. Not only the God that we serve is able to do it, but he will. This is what David said. There's a common language to faith. There's a common language to faith. I, the same Lord that delivered me from the lion and the bear. He's going to deliver this Philistine into my hand here. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with thee. I, I'm glad Saul had that much sense. It's hard to argue with God. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass on his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. Now, I, I don't have time to break all that down right now. In fact, it's probably a good place for me to jump off. I better just jump off right here. We'll, we'll just stop it right there. Because, well, you know, Saul wanted David to be mistakenly looking like him. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> a lot of y'all know the rest of the story. But, but nevertheless, th that, that's the deal. Now, in the course of these stories is embedded the winning ways of godly wisdom. I just took you through these things and, and only through the revelation knowledge and help of the Holy Spirit could we find ourselves, I hope that you were standing with me at the tent of Saul, standing with me when David showed up at the field in the theater of the battle. I, I hope you, were, you could stand with me also to see the soldiers of Israel cowering behind the lion. I want you to be with me when Eliab went into his diatribe and put his own little brother down. Right. You little haughty, pride, prideful little joker, you. <laughs> Who watching them a little sheep? You better hurry up and get on back home. There's no place for you. This is a place for real. So see, it was all sham. Yeah. David comes up and says, ain't nobody else doing anything. <laughs> Why can't I ask what's going down? <laughs> you know, I mean, hey. And see, the thing was, what's sad Eliab and all them said all that stuff, but they never did rehearse when David went out there and got that lion and that bear. I bet you somebody knew about that. I bet you Jesse knew about it, but they didn't say anything. He's just putting David down, man. But look at, look at the stuff that David was doing. Obviously, he wasn't bragging about it or anything like that, but that didn't make it any, any uh, less true. He did it. I guess it ain't bragging if you can do it. So he did it. That's what he's telling the king. I noticed he didn't tell Eliab that. He didn't waste time trying to reconvince his brother. You know, you, you know, Eliab, you remember that lion, that bear I took out. You know, it, I don't even know if David told the story. The Bible doesn't reveal it. Amen. Amen. But he did rehearse it to Saul. Because David, this is the winning, winning ways of godly wisdom. I'm before a king. He, the king needs some assurance that I'm qualified to go out here. Dave, who knows? David might have been the guy that started special forces, Jonathan. Okay. <laughs> 
He might have been the first Green Beret. I don't know, man. He might have been the first SEAL. Who knows? And he went out on a singular mission and accomplished it. And what happened when he did it? Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I said, I'm going to jump. I'm, about, I'm almost jumped. I'm just in the air right now, y'all. Hang on. <laughs> so, so at that particular point, I'm just saying, you know, all the rest of the army found strength and courage. If nothing else, even if it was out of pride, we can't believe this little teenager came in out of nowhere and took this dude out. And we got a whole army here, and we've been sitting here on the line of scrimmage for four quarters and couldn't advance the ball three inches. It's a shame. But when David did what he did, they took out the army of the Philistines. It's amazing. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And Father, we thank you for the word today. I thank you that it enters into the hearts of people right now, God, who find themselves facing what they believe to be insurmountable, inconquerable odds and challenges in their life. They are diverse kinds of challenges and issues, Lord, but none is unfamiliar to you. And in the greatest question I have found in the Scripture, ask, is anything too hard for the Lord? And, oh, God, I just encourage your people today that there is no such thing that exists that is too hard for you. And I pray, God, that in the strength of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the word shared today, the story shared today, the anointing imparted today will lift, encourage, and bless, and strengthen each and every one upon whose ears these words fall. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. amen. Praise the Lord. I don't know about you, but I was just having a thrill sharing that story and what was more thrilling was God telling it. You thought I told it. I'm telling you God told it. He told it in a way that only he could tell it. Why? Because he was there when it all went down. And I got good news for you. Whatever your story is, he's there with you right now. Today, while it is still called today, I'm telling you, you call on the name of the Lord. For the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, rescued, preserved, and delivered. Don't call on something that's no God. Call on the one, the true, the only living God. And he will deliver you. I love what David said to the king. The same Lord. The same God that delivered me out of the paw of the bear and the paw of the lion will deliver this Philistine into my hand. He'll deliver me out of his hand. I thank God for that. David had no uncertainty whatsoever. He was sure. Other people thought he was cocky. Other people thought he was prideful. Other people thought he was beside himself. But David the Bible says in Daniel 11, 32, second part of the verse, they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. That's who we are as the people of God. I don't know who you are, where you are, but wherever you are, I'm going to ask you to please bow your head, close your eyes, and I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Let's go boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And pray this prayer from your heart to the heart of God because you've got his attention. And say, Dear God, in heaven I come to you realizing that in my life I have sinned and come short of your glory. I repent of all of my sin and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ the Son of the living God who died on the cross and shed his blood to save me from all of my sin is the Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I might be justified just as if I had never sinned. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live in me now. I believe that I receive eternal life 
through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, that I am now made a new creation in Christ Jesus, born again of the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, congratulations to you. You just got saved, born again of the Spirit of God. And I want to say welcome to the family of God. I congratulate you again because you are now a official citizen of the kingdom of God with all the rights and the privileges and the promises appertaining thereunto. Glory to God. Hallelujah.